Uh, I'm excited to welcome Divakar Gope from ARM. He will talk to us about optimizing large language model inference for ARM CPUs. Welcome. Uh, hi, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm Divakar Go. Um, today I'll be talking about some of the work that we have been doing in the context of large language models at ARM. The title of my talk is Optimizing Large Language Model Inference for ARM CPUs. So uh, let me begin with a brief background. Large language models or LLMs have transformed the way we think about language understanding and generation. As you're probably aware that a language model can predict the next word given an input question or a prompt. Large language models are trained with massive amounts of data to train and capture various language patterns. As a result, they can perform tasks ranging from summarizing and translating text to uh, um, responding in chatbot conversations. As a result, facilitating their efficient execution on ARM CPUs will expand the reach to billions of ARM devices spread all over the world. LLMs are typically supremely huge uh, in size. As a result, they are often uh, very much memory bandwidth bound and have a large weight memory footprint where ARM CPUs can achieve competitive performance against other IPs. Furthermore, ARM CPUs are omnipresent. They are pervasive. They provide portability and flexibility. As a result, a new LLM software compression scheme will sim just work seamlessly on ARM CPUs without much effort. So given all these advantages, now the question arises, what is the potential performance of LLMs on ARM CPUs deployed in smartphones and edge devices? And I'm going to talk a little more about that in this presentation. Some key results, uh, we use Microsoft's Pi 2 2.7 billion parameter 4-bit quantized model as our benchmark. We use a state-of-the-art C++ runtime, such as Plamado all or evolution. We recognize that, that the baseline kernels in the Lama.cppx C++ runtime cannot exploit the full potential of ARM CPUs. As a result, we developed a series of highly optimized matrix vector multiplication and matrix matrix multiplication kernels, also commonly known as GEMV and GEM kernels, for 4-bit quantized LLMs, and demonstrated a significant improvement uh, in the two key runtime metrics, such as time to first token and token per second that we care about in the context of LLM. So, for example, for this Phi2 model, we get about 2.3x to 1.4x, 4.5x speed up over the uh, Lama CPP like C++ runtime. So, in this um, talk, we use Microsoft 2.7 billion parameter model. Uh, this model is made of a set of uh, transformer layers. It has 32 layers and uh, 2.7 billion parameters. So, now the question is how does a language oh. model? Uh, so now uh, the question is, uh, how does a language model uh, like Phi2 work? Uh, given an input prompt, each round through this um, LLM network generates a um, uh, new output token. So for example, given an input prompt in the very first round, it generates the token one. The new token is then fed into this LLM for generating the token in the next round. So for example, this token, was, token one is fed to the LLM to generate the token to in the next round. The state or history associated with the LLM gradually builds up and is carried from the from left to the right in this figure as more tokens are generated. And I'll illustrate that with an example in the next slide. This same process is repeated many times through this LLM network until a complete answer is generated. So to summarize, a typical LLM inference involves going through this LLM network multiple times and generating many tokens. So uh, let's go over an example. Given an input prompt such as what are three popular chess openings, in the very first round, the LLM network generates an output token there. And most of the matrix multiplication involved in the very first round are matrix matrix multiplication, that is their gem operations. So ideally for the next round, the LLM network should need this initial prompt, that is what are three popular chess openings, along with the token generated so far, that is there as the input context to generate the next token. However, since all of the tokens in the input context for the second round remain same to that of the first round, except the large generated token that is there, the LM network uh, typically uh, saves the embedding of this initial prompt, that is what are three popular chess openings in a software cache, also commonly known as LM's key value cache, when those embeddings are generating for the very first time in the first round. 
the nlm network in the second round then simply retrieves those embeddings from the software cache and processes only the large generated token that is there in conjunction with this retrieved embeddings and generate this next token that is r the nlm network then updates the history with this last token that is there and repeats the process until a full answer is generated one thing uh, it is worth noting here that except for the very first round um, the take generation process at each step primarily involves or takes into account the last generated token that is a single row of input activation that also means that except for the very first round the take generation process primarily involves matrix vector multiplication operations that is gmv so to summarize generating the very first token that is the prompt processing part involves gem operation whereas take generation afterwards simply involves gmv operations so uh, for this talk we use on cortex series apus for our benchmarking these are readily available reliable benchmarking platform uh, because these llms are really huge in size they are uh, typically aggressively quantized to uh, four bit in order to ease the bandwidth and footprint pressure anyway after such aggressive quantization the drop in quality is uh, very marginal in this talk we use a four bit quantized llm for all our evaluation while we used an four bit quantized llm to drive this discussion uh, i must say that there are other quantization schemes out there and the optimizations that i'm going to show in the next couple of slide and you perform for this four bit quantization they will very easily can be uh, extended to the other quantization schemes as well so for typical operations in llm this weight matrix b that is the yellow matrix here is significantly larger than the input activation matrix that is the green matrix and the output c matrix that is the blue matrix as a result compression of this yellow weight matrix is key to reducing memory and bandwidth consumption given an given an llm weight matrix and an initial prompt the lama cpplx c++ runtime typically uses a dot product kernel to compute a single result in the output activation matrix that also means the dot product kernel simply uses a one row of the activation matrix and then one column a single column of the weight matrix to generate a single value in the output matrix and they repeat the process to generate each point in the output matrix until they uh, populate the whole uh, matrix um, furthermore when this weight matrix is compressed to four bits they are typically compressed using a block quantization scheme uh, in order to keep the quantization noise low and i will discuss a little more about that in the next slide uh given in weight tensor this block quantization scheme um uh, essentially consider a small set of weight values for example in this case it consider 32 fp16 values at a time and quantizes them to 4 bit using a local scaling factor rather than quantizing the entire weight tensor using a global scaling factor the block quantization scheme then move on to the next set of 32 fp16 values and quantizes them to 4 bits using a different local scaling factor and it repeats the process until that whole weight, weight tensor is covered so for example um as you can see here that it compresses the 64 bytes to 18 bytes using this block quantization scheme so in this case this 4 bit q40 block wise quantization scheme it uses an fp16 scale factor uh, and then interleaves the uh, low half and the high half of that 32 four bit values in the subsequent 16 byte that makes it to the 2 plus 16 18 bytes in total and this weight format is chosen to optimize space and bandwidth in the case of activations uh, an 8 bit block format is chosen to facilitate uh, the subsequent dot product computation with this block quantized weights so because this llm weight matrices are uh, compacted to um, quantized to 4 bit block format the baseline kernels that is the dot product kernels in the lama cpplx c++ kernels requires to pay some overhead or tax in dequantizing them in terms of unpacking and expanding the 4 bit weights to eight sign 8 bit values before they can perform the uh, the standard integer dot product operation they also need to convert the fp16 scale values for both weights and activations to fp32 values before they can combine them to got the resultant scaling factor and multiply that with the integer dot product to get the final fp32 dot product so in the subsequent slide i'll show how we have um, optimized the dequantized path in our optimized kernel but 
Um, before that, one thing is very clear that since this dot product kernel in the baseline C++ runtime consider a single weight column at a time, there is definitely no reuse of the activation that is the left side. There is a lot more redundant loads. Um, there is definitely no reuse of the uh, FP16 and FP32 scale values for the activations because um, the, the dot product kernel consider a single weight plot at a time. There is definitely no use of vector instructions for converting the FP16 scales to FP32 values for a series of weight columns. And furthermore, since they uh, consider a single weight column at a time, there are there are quite a few scalar or zero scalar operations in the compute pipeline. This also means that while this uh, the dot product kernel operates on a vector of values, they're still operating on a single weight column of that weight matrix. As a result, you need to uh, use reduction operation in order to uh, uh, accumulate values from these partial values from different vector lanes to generate the final FP32 dot product. All these inefficiencies, such as uh, fewer reuse of activation, like a lot of scalar operations, fewer reuse of vector instructions, they like in turn leads to the fact that a lot of computer instruction now do not do useful Mac work, which results in a very poor Mac utilization efficiency of simply uh, uh, all 17%. So in order to increase reuse of activations and avoid uh, the scalar or zero scalar operations, um, we consider a set of weight columns in our optimized kernels. So for example, in this figure, you can see we have considered four weight columns a orange weight column, a yellow weight column, and a green weight column, and then blue weight column at a time. Not only we consider a set of weight columns, we also interleaves weights from this weight column in a very particular format. So you can see in the optimized format, for the very first um, optimized column, it interleaves weights from all these four differently colored weight columns. And similarly, the second column in the optimized format also interleaves weights from the four different color weight columns and repeats that process is repeated. We interleave the weights of in this optimized format in this very particular particular way in order to make sure that each vector lane, that is this four vector lane now can generate or uh, and, uh, like operate on the dot product value for its own weight column and generate four output values without involving any reduction operation in the compute pipeline. This definitely uh, leads to an extra weight rearrangement cost that you can see that I have added in the top of the dequant pipeline. However, one thing I must say that, that since now our optimized kernel consider a series of weight columns, as a result, there are far more reuse of activations. There are fewer redundant loads. There is more reuse of the activation scale uh, in the way like in the way of amortizing it over many columns. There is um, more use of vector instruction for converting the FP16 scales to FP32 values for a series of weight columns, and there is uh, no more uh, scalar or zero scalar operations in the pipeline, which also means that you do not need to use any reduction operations to accumulate values from different vector lanes. This in turn improves the MAC utilization efficiency to 21%, which is a 26% theoretical speed up over the original code. Because you are here uh, uh, um, uh, like rearranging the weights like the weight matrix in the LLM network for this optimization, you can definitely do that offline so that cost can go away. And furthermore, by saving the sign values directly onto the nibble, like in the like in the eight bit uh, nibble, four bit nibble, when you are compacting them offline, we can get rid of the some of the subtraction operation from the dequant path as well. This further improves the MAC utilization efficiency to thirty one percent, which is an eighty five percent theoretical speed up over the original code. So, so far I have shown that how we have optimized the matrix vector multiplication kernels, that is the GMV kernel that are used for the text generation phase. Um, but as we, as I told in the beginning that we also need to use GEM kernels for generating the very first token that is for the prompt phase. So we optimize GEM kernels also, they use the same optimizations as GEMV. Uh, but on top of that, they use this ARM specific MMLA instruction, which can consider multiple input rows at a time and generate multiple output rows. This further improves the materialization efficiency to 40%. So moving on to some of the results, key results. So we uh, evaluated all our um, uh, optimizations for this specific, uh, for this talk on an ARM Cortex series CPUs. 
Um, so for the prompt processing part, that is for this, for generating the very first token, we can use the optimized gem kernels and this optimized gem kernels improve the token per second by about 2.3x over the uh, baseline kernels of this uh, uh, Lama CPP like C++ runtime. For the take generation part, like like for like after the first round for the um, like moving forward for all the uh, like uh, subsequent round, um, we can use optimized GMV operations for them and they improve the token per second by about 1.45x over the baseline kernels. So in con conclusion, I will say that ARM CPUs are definitely <laughs> a very suitable platform for all this LLM inference. So in this talk, um, while I touched base on a, on a very small series of optimizations that we did, but we have a lot of other kernel model and runtime optimizations that we have done internally in order to improve the runtime even further. And these are outside the scope of this talk. And I'll conclude this talk uh, with a demo video that shows an LLM running uh, on an, a mid-range ARM CPU. So let me just switch over to that. Yeah, so I'll just play it for first 30 seconds. Uh, and this is this was done on the uh, like Meta's Llama 2 7 billion parameter model, and um, like you'll see that uh, it displays the token per second at the right top of the display. So as it generating tokens for the prompt at the text generation part, it will show the token per second that it can process, and you can see that the that uh, like that it shows such a seamless generation of uh, tokens in this process. So yeah, I'll, I'll uh, stop the video here. It has another 50 seconds, but this process repeats and things are very seamless here. So yeah, uh, with that, I'll open the floor um, for Q&A. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's really cool. Arm, Arm is everywhere, right? So I think that's really exciting to see some progress in, in deploying chats. We have a couple of questions here. One is uh, suggestions to start using TinyML on Cortex M4 processor. Can you suggest some learning paths? Um, Cortex M4. So for this ones, we generated the numbers for Cortex um, A7 and Cortex X3. Uh, Cortex M4, like um, like yeah, we can we can go down to the any level that you want. Uh, as um, yeah, so like what I'd like to say, anything we have done, these are pretty much model ag agnostic and a lot more platform agnostic also. So these are definitely extendable to any any other platform that you want. That includes the Raspberry Pi also. Cool. And another quick question: What ARM core and device is the Cookie Demo running on? Say it again. What ARM core and device is the Cookie Demo running on? Oh, this one. Uh, this one uh, is running on a mid-range um, Cortex series. Like uh, like this silicon is out there. Like it's in. Um, I think in. Redmi phone or in Xiaomi phone, one of those, uh, like, um, like, yeah, one of the mid range code that we have out there, and it is from two years ago, like, it is not even in like and most uh, like up to date code. Yeah, got it. Awesome. There are a couple more questions, but I'll take the time to, to thank you, Hidi Bakar, for your time. A super interesting presentation and demo. Um, if you can stick around and, and help uh, answer some of the questions in the chat, that'd be fantastic. A big thank you again to all of our sponsors that make this possible. Uh, in particular, thank you to the executive strategic partners of TinyML, Qualcomm AI, Advancing AI Research to make efficient AI ubiquitous, also Sentient, making Edge AI a reality, the Platinum Strategic Partners, Embed UR, uh, Sony AI, De uh, Deploy Vision AI at the edge of scale, the Gold Strategic Partners, Arm, Edge Impulse, Infineon, Renaissance, ST Micro, and Synaptics. And the silver strategic partners, which we have here, AI Zip, Arduino, Brainship, Efficient, Greenwaves, Gravity, Climax, Imagimob, Inatera, Noda AI, NXP, Procter Gamble, Schneider Electric, SenseML, Silicon Labs, and TDK. So that concludes our first day. Don't forget, we have a lot more action back agenda for tomorrow as well, starting at the same time. So that concludes our session for today. And thank you for joining everyone. See you tomorrow.